inspired, inerrant word of God. That no copy and no translation is complete and without error of any. Hence, it's not perfect. And since it's not perfect, it, it can't be completely God's word. Now, that is the view of uh, a number of prominent Christians, we might say, in Christianity. Uh, here's one of Pastor Sam's. I read this at the conference. I'll just read it again. And I want you to understand this. This is, this is what we're dealing with. He says, I believe the complete Bible to be the absolute, inerrant, infallible word of God and our final authority in matters of faith and practice. I say complete because no one translation can possibly convey all the truth set forth in the manuscript which God originally inspired. Something is always lost in an extended translation from one language to another. Thus, sometimes we must dig further into the original languages to find light which the translation cannot or does not reveal. Okay, so that's his viewpoint. We saw the tape at the conference by Ivan Bergener where he said the same thing basically and he brought out a lot of points trying to substantiate his viewpoint that no translation is complete, inerrant, and without error. They're contending that only the original autographs were the word of God. Now, we're gonna look at your, I want you to read something first of all from this Chick Publications book that I got and then we're gonna look at our vocabulary thing before we actually start getting into this teaching. Let me just say it again. Now, a lot of you guys are not, maybe some of you are thinking of going into ministry like Bob and maybe Billy later on and you know some are already pastors here. But this chapter 11 in this book, it says if you are a preacher and you haven't taken the time to study the modern versions and haven't found out for yourself what is the truth, then start studying. Get the book and check it out. It's important. The spiritual lives of your people depend on it. It's your responsibility. If you are a preacher and you don't believe that we have the perfect, infallible word of God today, then what in the world are you doing in the ministry? You have no good news to tell. If God was lying when he said, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever, Isaiah 40, verse 8, then how do you know he wasn't lying when he said, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, John 3, 36. If God doesn't have the power to preserve his word for us perfectly like he promised, then what makes you think he has the power to save men's soul from everlasting fire? Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, Romans 5, 9. If God doesn't have the power to keep his promises, then what makes you think that he has power to change life? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. If God doesn't have the power to keep his word, then what makes you think he can give power in your preaching? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Being a preacher is great honor, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, 1 Timothy 6.11. But it is also a grave responsibility. Woe be to unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord, Tom's favor, 23.1. If you don't believe that the word of God is true and perfect like God promised and preserved it, and he gives another scripture, he said, then you have absolutely no business being in the ministry. And that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, why I'm even designing this class to start with is there's a good number of men here tonight. I really praise the Lord for this because there is a real heavy onslaught coming down the line stating that only the original autographs are the word of God. And subsequently, what we have in our hands, no matter what translation it is, it's not completely and fully the word of God in their eyes. No one translation can be the word of God. Then I'd ask Mr. Stan, what are we supposed to do? Get 15 translations? And how do I know which one has got the right word of God? Do I have to preach from 20 Bibles? You see what I mean? And how does he know that no one can be, in order for him to make a statement that no one translation can be completely the word of God, then he must know how many it would take to be. See, he would have to know that. Or you can't make a statement like that. So these are some of the problems we're being faced with and wh what's gonna happen. Now, first of all, we're gonna, I'm gonna just briefly go through this sheet, just so you're familiar with some terms, okay? And, okay, the first one up there says manuscript. Now, the writing, manuscripts are the writings in Hebrew and Greek of whole books or fragments of Old Testament and New Testament scripture. If you don't understand these things, because these are not full explanations, just let me know and we'll fill them in. Original autographs. An original, it's an original manuscript of an author or the human author of the scriptures. In other words, 
when, the, when the Lord inspired Paul to do 1 and 2 Corinthians, when, when he had actually had those written, they were the original autograph. Okay, that's what that means. A text is a selection of certain manuscripts out of many, or of the many. There may have been thousands of Greek manuscripts, copies of copies of copies. So one man would come along and he would select a group of manuscripts out of this whole passage of manuscripts, and he would compile a Greek text out of that. Okay, that's what a text is. And our version is a translation of the text into another language. Some man comes along and takes Erasmus's Greek text, or, or Stephan's Greek text, or Elzebra's Greek text, and he translates it into another language. That's now called a version, or a translation. A redaction. Now these are words we're going to deal with when we get into the manuscript evidence and, and uh, textual criticism. And some of these things are not actually a science. They're prefabricated theories and guesses some of this stuff is not even, doesn't even have any credibility to it. A, a redaction means the act of reducing or shaping of literary matter into proper form and condition for publication. I've got all these Greek manuscripts in front of me and I've drawn a text out of them and now I begin to alter the text or reduce it or modify it so that it's fit for publication. That's what that means. A recension is the editing of the text into the most plausible reading. I've got five manuscripts with five little variations in the readings I have to take that now and, and, uh, and put it into a, a proper one reading, so that's called a redaction. I'm editing the text. A recension, I'm sorry, that's a recension, is the editing of the text into the most plausible reading. A conflation is a blending together of variant readings. That's what I meant. You've got five different readings and you blend them. You don't, you don't take any one of the five, you blend all five together. A codex is leaves or sheets like a, like a flat book. Okay, it's like you've got sheets of paper here or notebooks that are called codex when it comes to Bible manuscripts as opposed to scrolls which were a continuous roll of material like the old Hebrew Torah, they would open up like in a scroll. Now unicles were large block-like letters sometimes called majuscules. They're, so they're block-type Greek letters, all capital letters. Now it's important, why am I bringing this out? These are important because when you're dealing with manuscripts, manuscripts are dated and the, sources are the, the, the source of the, of the text or the manuscript is usually determined by what it was written on and in what style it was written. Unicles being uh, earlier, and the next one we come up with is um, cursives, which are lower case letters, continuous strokes, what we call cursive. That style came into existence later, so this is all important when you're dating manuscripts. Now, vellum. It's a material. It's actually leather smooth animal skins prepared for writing on. Papyrus was from plants called Biblos, since we got the word Bible, which was grown in a particular area in the, in, uh, around Egypt, Alexandria, and it became what later on what we call now paper and parchment. And that's also important because documents that were written on papyrus rather than vellum shows not only the dating, but the area which these manuscripts came from. Lectionaries are early church service books which had the, the style of the worship, the order of the church, and it would have like, it was like a hymnal. You ever see these hymnals that got like, in the back they've uh, song books, and then they've got like things in the back, like little responses and so forth, and scripture readings? Maybe now, Luther's church has a lot of that. Yeah. Well, see, they had thousands of these in the early church, too, quoting verses of scripture that were in the Bible. Patristic quotations are sermons and studies by the early church fathers using quotations from the Bible. They had many sermons written by different church fathers quoting different passages of the scripture at a really early age, like 100, 200 AD. And so these are important when you're dealing with manuscripts. Church fathers are the men who lived after the apostles for like a couple hundred years after the apostles. Orthography, and this is where we're going to show this on the board, is the study of letters or the changes of, of letters and spelling. And now this is just a little tricky. This is what I thought would just amuse you a little bit. Uh, up here on the board, I've got a thing, how your language grew, okay? Now, this is English as we see it in 800, which was called Anglo-Saxon, 8900, I'm sorry. That is part of the 23rd Psalm. You know that? You know what that says? I will fear no evil. This is, the, this is what it says here. I will fear no evil. Now you see how languages change, not doubt and evil. I will fear no evil. 
Now, obviously, if we put that in our translations today, nobody would know how to read that, right? Well, this is, the, this is what the changes that language went through. And so the King James Bible, when people say, well, what are you trying to say until 1611 you didn't have a Bible? They don't know what they're talking about. First of all, the English language began to develop around here. Before that, most people spoke Anglo, Saxon, Jute, uh, which would be like types of German, and Latin. And so what they did is all the preaching and teaching was done in Latin. As the language began to develop, Greek texts were already in existence and were beginning to be translated into what was now becoming English. And so you had Bibles long before the King James came already in English. But they were, there were revisions made because, like I say, look at how the language developed. And that was just part of that process. So when people say there's changes in the King James Bible's editions, and they cite stuff like that, I mean, that, I call it blowing smoke. That's all that is. I mean, what's the difference if I, if I spell a word F-E-A-R, uh, which is fear, or I use one of those other words to spell it? You see, it means the same thing. Our language changed, we changed with it. But it's still the exact representation. Now, I was talking to Ray on the way over. You bring it, you take a Jehovah Witness Bible. We we're going to do that later in. And you go, to in, uh, you go to Genesis, and it said, The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Well, in Hebrew, spirit is the translation of the Hebrew word ruach, which means always spirit or wind. Okay, not air, but spirit or wind. The only two meanings it's got. They changed spirit, the Holy Spirit, to active force. Now, where they get the word active and where they get the word force out of the two Hebrew words, I have no idea. It is absolutely not a translation. It's absolutely an interpretation. That is really taking liberties and shouldn't be done. Now, anyway, getting back to what we're doing here, we saw what we're dealing with now is a real strong wave coming down saying that only the original autographs are the word of God. This is the doctrinal statement of the uh, Brian Bible Fellowship, okay? That's a sister organization with the Berean Bible Society, and the Berean Bible Society's doctrinal statement says the same thing. The entire Bible in its original writings is verbally inspired of God and is a plenary authority. Now, to substantiate their faithlessness, which they call the sane approach, they cite problems of a purely scientific nature in three areas which combined form the science of textual criticism. Number one, textual problems. Text type source of the text, dating, and the variations within the text itself. Number two, you can write this down if you want, linguistic. Okay, number one, there's three areas that I know of which comprises what we call textual criticism. Number one is the textual problems themselves, which include the text type, the source, the dating of the manuscripts, and the variations in the manuscripts. That problems of that nature it deals with. <coughs> okay, then, ready yet? Let me just slow down here. Uh, variation. That means like there's uh, different readings and so forth, and some are spelled different. There's a little different word order between some manuscripts and the other ones. Okay, then, two linguistics. L-I-N-G-U-I-S-T-I-C-S. Okay. Number three, you ready for that one yet? Oh, linguistics is language barriers of translation. Problems of language barriers of translation. Everybody ready here? Number three, human imperfection. And that would include scribal and typographical errors.
And we're going to do this chart here in a little bit. I want to show you how we're going to start the correct method to actually go through this uh, doctrine of translation as opposed to this one. Okay, now under human imperfection, we got scribal and typographical errors. All right? So we need to be familiar with these problems, and we need to have an answer to them. Because the ones I said who call it the sane approach and tell us that our Bible can't be complete and without error, the reason they're telling us that is because they come through the scientific approach. They come through textual criticism. They begin with textual criticism. And that's why they tell us that our Bible is all fraught with errors and so forth. And these are the three areas of textual criticism. Now, there may be more, and someone may define them a little different, but they're pretty, we're not going to get super technical on this thing. We're just going to deal with it so we can understand these. So we're going to know, we're going to look at these problems when we get to that part of it. We're going to deal with these problems and give an answer to them and find out that they're not problems. But we're not going to start there where they start. That's where they make their big mistake. They start with science. Now, we're going to do this in a twofold way. We're going to establish a systematic Bible treatise on this subject and teach the correct method of preservation, transmission, and translation issues from a spiritual imperative found in the Bible. In other words, we're going to show the right way to deal with this. We're, going to, we're not going to start from science. We're going to start with what we call the spiritual approach from spiritual imperatives right taught right from the Bible and take it from there. Now, and we're going to deal with it in that way. The question I've asked in the book that I did, the question I asked at the conference, I'm going to say the same thing again. This is what you have to ask yourself when you're, when you're thinking about your Bible. Was it the divine intention of God Almighty for his people to have all of the word that he wanted them to have or not? Now, I hope you understand that question. It's a very important question and worded exactly that way. Was it the divine intention for God Almighty for his people to have all of the word that he wanted them to have or not? Well, if you say no, it's, it's a contradiction. Well, why is it a contradiction? Because if he didn't want them to have it all, they didn't have it all, and they got all that he did want them to have, right? So you can't say no. You have to say yes. And yes, it is a loaded question, but it's a proper question. I'm trying to point you to that. It was either God's intention for his people to have all of his word that he wanted them to have, or it was not his intention. Does my Bible teach me it was not God's intention to give me all the word he wanted me to have? Or is my Bible telling me it was God's intention to give me all the word he wanted me to have? You understand that? Okay, that's a very important question. We're going to look at it from that way. Now, number two, the other approach, we're going to look at all the objections raised against the position of version inerrancy, which is done by a wrong method. We're not only going to teach the proper way and develop a treatise on how to do this, but we're going to look at all the objections that are raised by the opponents of this teaching and uh, who are against version errancy, and we're going to see that that's done the wrong way and show why it is. Now, the sad part of this whole thing is, anyways, is that even our scholarly brothers who support our view and deal with textual criticism, like a lot of these guys who are writing books like Which Bible, Otis Four, and them, who are truly brothers in the Lord, and they're really defending this issue, what they do, they deal with textual criticism, but they try to defend, first of all, the textus receptus, and then they do it by citing that it's an accurate and reliable, and they defend it primarily from a scientific approach, and only secondarily from a spiritual, spiritual approach. Now, there's two things wrong with this approach. Now, get what I'm saying. They try mainly to defend the textus receptus, and while they're trying to defend the textus receptus, they're saying it's a reliable, an accurate text. That's one thing they say. Secondly, they're defending the Tectus Receptus from a scientific primarily and only using spiritual approach in a secondary sense. Now, there's two things wrong with that approach and make it impossible to defend. I want to read you how that sounds. And don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down which Bible I think is one of the, one of the greatest books out. But this is one author who wrote this uh, part of the article, and he's dealing with the Westcott and Hort textual theory, and he's finding problems with it. But he makes these, let me read you what he said here. No other writings were like the New Testament in the frequency of copyings made within a short time after their first appearing. This very multiplication of copies almost inevitably gave rise to a larger number of corruptions of the text, most of them unintentional and most of them insignificant. It must be insisted, however, that the in, in, uh, intentional causes cannot safely be disregarded. The New Testament is different from other documents. It goes without saying that the Old Testament is also, but that is not now being considered. 
in that it is the infallible word of God. This entails the fact that God will preserve the text against permanent or destructive error, although he does not guarantee the accuracy of any one manuscript. Now, you see what he's saying here? He's saying he believes that God will preserve the text against any permanent or destructive error, although he does not guarantee the accuracy of any one manuscript. Well, the problem with this is, first of all, God did not guarantee that he would, that he would preserve the text. He guaranteed that every word would be preserved. And he didn't guarantee the text. You see what I'm saying? So I understand what this brother's doing, but you see, that's what's happening. They're trying to defend the Texas Receptus, and it's going to cause a lot of problems, as we're going to see as we develop into this. Okay, that's one thing that's wrong with it. The second, uh, first thing that you have to understand is the Word of God is not accurate and reliable. It's perfect and inerrant, or it's not God's Word. There is no such a thing as accurate, reliable Word of God. It's either perfect and inerrant, or it's not God's Word. So don't tell me that manuscripts are accurate and reliable because that's not enough. See, that's not perfect. Uh, number two, no work of God can be established on a scientific basis only or primarily. There's scripture that says, after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. In other words, I commend these brothers and they are doing a good job, but where I feel, and I'm no match for them when it comes to the science, I don't know anything about what, they get into areas I have no knowledge in. But what I'm saying is, God can never be found out scientifically, and God's Word can never be found out scientifically. We must approach these things from a spiritual perspective and use the sciences subordinated to the principles and, uh, and dictations of God. Okay? When will a Christian ever learn <clears throat> that we are dealing with spiritual and miracle, and that overrides rationalism, intellectualism, and scholasticism, which is science falsely so-called? In other words, when we're dealing with the Word of God, we're not dealing with the literary work. We're not dealing with Homer, the Iliad, or the Odyssey, or any of these great uh, James Fenimore Cooper books. We're dealing with God's Word. And we can't just use literary science dealing with the Word of God. We have to realize we're dealing with the miraculous and with the spiritual, and we have to come through that perspective. Now, we must start from the ultimate extreme position. And this is what I want to really impress upon you. If anybody has a problem with this, I'd really like to talk to you about it personally. But I'm, I'm really telling you, this is what you've got to start from. That the present edition, the present edition of the King James Version is a verbally inspired, inerrant word of God. Anything short of that cannot be defended. I'll tell you that right now. It just cannot be defended. Now, we're going to look at this in a minute. I'm going to show you why I'm saying that. But I'm just telling you to think about this. Don't try to defend the Texas Receptus. Don't try to defend the manuscripts coming up to it. Don't try to defend some additions between the 1611 and the one you got now, come right to this end product, the present edition of the King James Bible, and make the statement that this is the verbally inspired, inerrant word of God. Start there. Okay? And there's going to be a reason why. Because nothing else can be defended. It'll just, be, it'll, it'll just blow you right out of the water. Now, there's one thing we're going to get out of the way right at the outset. Because it confuses and clouds the issue, and we're going to get this out of the way right away. This is an objection. Where before we lay our format, which I want to do, there's one objection that we must get out of the way so that our minds are not clouded down the road. And it is the position of the aforementioned prominent leaders, and some of them in the grace movement, that only the original autographs are the inerrant word of God. Now let's study this contention and get our minds fixed on it. Looking at your vocabulary sheet, you will see that an original autograph is the actual copy that was written of what the prophet or author was given by inspiration. Now in Zechariah chapter 7, 12, I just want to give you a verse in that to substantiate this thing on uh, inspiration. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 12. Yea, they made their hearts as, a, as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. That's inspiration. Listen to what it said here. He had sent his word in his spirit. Not by his spirit, in his spirit. Right? By the former prophets. Now that's what we're dealing with, okay? 
So now we, we see that the original autograph, uh, according to our sheet, is the actual copy that was written of what the prophet or author was given by inspiration of God. Now by taking the position that only the originals were inerrant in the perfect word of God, they've opened up the flanks to the enemy and undermined and betrayed the belief in the existence of an absolute standard of truth in the world. Now this is, you really gotta understand this. If this Bible is not absolutely true, all the way through, then there is no absolute standard of truth in the universe. You gotta really understand that there is no ultimate standard of truth which, whereby to guide and gauge every other truth. There is none, it does not exist. If this is not the word of God and here's why. There are no original autographs extant. What is a, what's the extant manuscript? Look on your sheet and somebody tell me. Okay, the answer is an extant manuscript is one that's still in existence. There are no original autographs extant. They do not exist. They have never existed in a collated form at any time in the history of God's people. In other words, there was no time in the history of God's people when all the word of God that was given up until that time progressively was all in one book or compiled together in the original autograph. That's a fact, just understand that. Never at one time was all the original autograph that God had given, let's say he got done writing Isaiah. Now there were still more books to come later on, but up until the time of Isaiah, they never had all the original autograph from Genesis to Isaiah at one time in one book in existence. So you gotta understand it, it's a very important point. So in effect, what they are saying is that we have no perfect word of God, it was never in existence, and not only that, when they talk about trying to recover the original autograph or the original text, it's a labor of insanity. How can you get close to something that you never had or doesn't exist? I just wanna show you a little trick, to, and I did this at the conference too. When someone comes up and tells you about how many mistakes there are in the King James Version that weren't in the original autograph, say, will you show me one of the original autographs that the mistake is in? Or e even a photograph of one? They can't do it. So you see, that's called smoke. That's another thing which they do. There is no original autograph, there never was any. So when people say there's a mistake, this does not line up with the original autograph, or we're trying to get as close to the original, how do you, they claim they got a science that can get them back as close to the original as possible. But you're gonna find out that it's all smoke again. What they're making up words, intrinsic value, probability. These words mean nothing. They're all in the mind of the person and they're not, there's no science to it whatsoever. It's conjecture. So we're, we gotta understand what we're doing now. There is no original autograph. I can't say that enough. So what you're in effect saying is that there is no word of God. There never was and there never will be. All we have is a facsimile of what God once originally gave. And they're content to settle for that. Then, they say we're laboring to recover the true original text. That's, that's what they're endeavoring to do right now, so we'll just hold our breath and wait till they get done. Now also, remember, another point that's gonna be a really important point, I, want, I hope you got this original autograph stuff set. Does everybody understand the implication there? Because it's really important to get that out of the way right away. Original autographs don't do me any good. They don't do anybody any good because they don't exist. So let's get that out of the way. And these people that talk about originals only, they tell us we're King James Version only. Well, that's a little bit more intelligent than being an original only because there ain't any. So, I mean, why, how can I follow something that doesn't exist? Or put my, base my life on it, I can't, but I could on this because at least I got it here, right? Okay, so we, let's get that issue right out of the way. The original autograph is insanity. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. Also remember that the scribe like Tertius or Baruch in the Old Testament actually did the writing. Most of the time the original author never did the actual writing and this is very important. We're gonna see this later on. You understand like when Isaiah was speaking, let's say Jeremiah was speaking the words of the Lord, Jeremiah wasn't doing the writing in the manuscript. Who was doing the writing? Baruch, was Baruch under inspiration? No, that's a very important point. Now don't get the wrong idea. I also believe that the original autograph was a verbally inspired, inerrant, perfect word of God, but that it was the intention of God Almighty to preserve it in copies and transmit it onto all languages and nations. In other words, 
The original autographs were the beginning of the process and not the end of it. We do not need the original autographs. If we did, God would have preserved them. Check Deuteronomy 17, 17. See, people think that the Lord is a little bit sloppy. He knew we didn't need them. He says you got something just as good, so don't bother to preserve them. If, we, if God needed them, he would have preserved them. I mean, he kept his people alive 40 years in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 17, 17. It says here, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver, silver and gold. And it shall be, speaking of their king, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book, out of that which is before the priest the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now there is a lot said there. He, Moses is telling the people, when you have a king, and he sits on his throne, tell the king to make a copy so that he could do what? Keep all the words of this law. So then, isn't God telling you that the copy is going to be exactly what the word of God was in the original autograph? And he's telling them to make copies? Is it God's intention to make copies, to, to duplicate his word? And is the copy exactly equivalent with the word of God, the original? Isn't it saying this here? Okay. So let's just hold that thought. Now, what I want to do is go to the blackboard and just clear up this chart a little bit, then we'll proceed. Jim, let me know if I'm running out of time, so we're going to go in or out, okay? A couple hours, okay. What I said before is what I would suggest is to start with the present edition of the King James Bible. Don't start back here with the original autograph. Okay, original manuscript, OM. Okay, we got Hebrew scrolls and Alpha and Omega representing the Greek text, right? Don't start here. That's where textual criticism would like to start. They don't start with the original because they don't have them. They start somewhere in here with, with the science of the copy. So here's what I'm saying, and I want to draw this. Start here and go back. Okay? Start with, with the premise that the King James Version, present edition, is the Word of God, verbally inspired and inerrant without mistakes. Go, now go back and start with the original manuscripts. There isn't any, but to start with that theory that, they're, that they were given and that they were inspired of God and that they were inerrant, okay? That's what I mean by that. Go back to these now. We admit that they were, there were such a thing. We know that there were. God said there were. Now go back and start with that and do this. Trace the line all the way up to the King James Version, and this is what you want to do. First of all, you had the originals. Then you had copies, okay? Then there was corruptions of copies, okay? We're going to deal with this later on when we get into the manuscript stuff. Then what happened is there was corrections of copies, okay? And then there was text, and then from the text there was versions, okay? And now, not only there, but from the versions there was additions to the present King James edition. So what I'm saying is start with the premise that what I have in my hand now is a verbally inspired, inerrant word of God. Now I go back and admit that there were original manuscripts, and they were verbally inspired, and they were inerrant, and God told us and intended us to make copies. The copies got corrupted, we admit that, and that's where textual science starts, begins, and ends. They can't get out of this. And then we're going to see that the corruptions came but corrections were made, and then after the corrections were made, texts were being drawn from these copies, and then versions were made from the text, and then editions of the versions until we finally got our present edition King James Bible, which is, by the way, nothing other than the authorized 1611 version. Okay, so we're going to trace that right down. But that's the way, that's the way to do it. We're, we're going to start by laying the principles Okay, and this is what we're going to start with right now before we waste any more time. Why did God use writing for his word? Why do you think God, in, why is it obvious that God put his word into writing? He said it in Deuteronomy 17, 17, didn't he? He wrote it. Why didn't he carry it orally? 
Okay, right. But we're, we're admitting something now. It's obvious it was God's intention. He didn't put it in videotape, did he, like we're doing now? He didn't play it on records, did he? He didn't, he didn't sing it in the wind, in the, in the air, or have birds contain it, or animals, certain species of animals carry his word and be able to tell it to us, did he? He could have, right? Couldn't he? Or he could have had it so that only the people that believed in him got the spiritual word of God implanted in their brain and knew it, right? He didn't do that. He said, make copies of it and write it. And he, he even raised up a certain class of people called scribes. You know what scribes are in Hebrew? Sopharim. Sopharim means books. They're bookmen, men of the book. All their job was just to do was to write. So we're, we're beginning to lay a principle here. It's obvious that God intended writing. But before writing came, there was something else. But now, another question you should ask yourself is, we ask, why did God use writing? We've got to find it out. Why did he use writing? Second question you should ask yourself is, why did God use Hebrew? And why did he use Greek to be the language that his word originally came in? Was that just a chance? Did he happen to come to Hebrew people because they happen to speak Hebrew? And he says, well, I'll, they're my people, so I'll just use that language. Or did God design the people and the language together? Why did he use Greek? And why did he use it at the time he used it? These are all very important questions that a textual critic never asks. He just starts with the idea that it was in Hebrew and it was in Greek, and he comes up with all the problems. He never begins to ask himself, if there's an almighty wisdom in the universe called God, then do you think he just happened to pick Hebrew and he happened to pick Greek? No, it was done by design and intentional purpose. And when you begin to see God always does things by design and purpose, and when you begin to get into these things which are going to... Everything just begins to open up to you, and you find there's no problem. The only problem is with the, with the skeptics, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to start right off with the biblical account of language. Now, <clears throat> first of all, there's two approaches to language, and I did this at the conference also. There are the people that say that language just evolved, and I'm going to read you this guy's theory again. Now, this guy called Gordon Clark, who was a professor... Uh, uh, at Butler University, he was the past chairman, I'm sorry, of, of the philosophy department at Butler University, quotes some scientific linguistic person saying this, the contemporary theories of language are often based on an evolutionary philosophy in which human language is supposed to have originated in the squeals and the grunts of animals, and the first words ever spoken were supposedly nouns or names proceeded by, produced by imitating the sounds of animals or waterfalls. Or if the object made no noise, some arbitrary method was used to attach a name to it. Now, you see the neat scientific, some arbitrary method. You see, that's what we're going to find all the way through this, right? Some arbitrary method. Well, we don't know what it is, but sounds good. So they're saying, remember our theology of world history, how there's always two streams? What they're saying is language evolved, see? And the way a baby was looked at something, an animal went, <coughs> so the baby went, <coughs> and then it was a waterfall, <coughs> And the baby began to imitate these sounds, and they said, waterfalls. Blah, blah, blah. And little by little, language evolved, so now we got speaking just like we are. Well, the Bible gives us a different viewpoint of how languages began. And again, we, this is really important. It sounds just, you wonder, why am I doing this? Why am I coming through language? Because if you learn the principles, you'll never have to be shaken by anything that comes along, because you're always on solid ground. Genesis 1, 27. We're going to see that God had a purpose for endowing man with speech as soon as he was created, which became language, and then right after that came writing, and it was all done by a divine purpose of God for a reason. He didn't just give man language so that man could run around and say dirty words. Okay, Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, this is neat, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you. God is speaking to Adam and speaking to Eve. Did they hear what he said? Was he speaking in a voice? Okay. So they must have understood what he was saying, right? Okay, now, the only language we know that God was saying this in had to be Hebrew, because we have it written in Hebrew, we don't have it in any other language. So in other words, you can say, well, he was saying it in angel tongue, or you make up whatever you want, but the Bible records it in Hebrew. So we must assume 
that God was speaking to, to Adam in Hebrew. Okay? If it wasn't, it doesn't really make any difference, but let's just assume it was Hebrew. The point is that God is speaking and God said. And then he says a bunch of things. And Adam, here's what God said. He had to understand that. This must presuppose that they understood him. God didn't reveal these things to Adam through the created creation, like Mr. Bergener says, the creation is out there, it's corrupt and polluted, but God's glory is still shining through it and giving a message. Well, why didn't God just say, Adam, just look around at the plants and the animals and the birds and the waterfall, and I'll tell you all I want you to know. He didn't say that. That's called general revelation, and it's very limited. God spoke words to Adam and Eve. They understood what God said. They were created with speech, and they were created with language already, right at the outset. Now, this Gordon Clark writes a positive aspect of language, and this is really good to listen to this. If God created man in his own rational image and endowed him with the power of speech, which he did, then a purpose of language, in fact, the chief purpose of language, would naturally be the revelation of truth to man and the prayers of man to God. Now listen to what this guy is saying. If God created man speaking and understanding speech, then there must be a purpose to that, right? And he's saying that the purpose must be that so that God can reveal truth to man. And didn't he say, I have given you every herb bearing seed and do this and do that? And then the prayers of man back to God. Didn't Adam talk to God? Okay. That was the purpose for language. That's why God created man with language. This thought immediately overturns the objection to verbal inspiration that is based on an alleged finitude and imperfections of language. Now listen to what he's saying here. When people say that, that finite language and the imperfections of language are an objection to verbal inspiration that God gave every word by verbal inspiration, the very principle that God made man speaking and understanding his language destroys that theory. Now, if reason or logic which makes speech possible is a God-given faculty, it must be adequate to its divinely appointed task. And this task is the reception of divinely revealed information and the systemizing of that in information into dogmatic theology. So in other words, if reason or logic which makes speech possible is a God-given faculty, and it had to be, or man couldn't do it, then it must be adequate to its appointed task. What's its appointed task? So that man could have the reception of divinely revealed information and systemize that, okay, which we do and use it, right? Now, these are just simple basic principles, but once they're understood, they are dynamite. If you, got, if you just can grasp what, what this is being said here, we're gonna see that God had an intention of making man create it with speech, articulating, and able to talk. It wasn't just done as, a, as like some kind of a little bonus or something, there was a purpose to why God did it. Ray, do you have a question? Right, I was gonna read that, right. Okay, but that's okay, no, that's fine. Adam gave names to the animals, right. I'm not gonna read all these verses I read at the conference, but in Genesis uh, 2.20, he did give names to the animals, he called them names. In Genesis 3, 9 to 12, we have a, we have a, a narrative of God Almighty, Adam and Eve, and even the serpent all speaking to one another. And they understood each other, and it wasn't done by evolutionary process, Bob? Certainly, yeah. Yeah, sure. They communicated. I don't know what language they used, but now we're going to see this is the next process. Now, get this, speech. Speech is not language. Speech is articulating or making sounds, like I'm doing now, which represent intelligent symbols called words, which represent objects, abstract or intangible thought, okay? In other words, my vocal cords are making sounds, and sounds are coming out of my mouth. But these sounds are words, and they're intelligible, and they're representing tangible and intangible thoughts. Right? That's speech. Now, language is the community sharing in and the mental understanding of these articulated sounds. You understand what I'm saying, right? And you could answer me back, right? So that's called language. We're a community. We're sharing in the articulation and the understanding of these articulations, right? That's language. Now, speech and language were both 
given by God Almighty to the original pair, Adam and Eve, right at creation. They were born speaking, and they were born with language, right then and there. There was a reason why God gave them language and, and gave them speech, because he could talk to them and communicate, and they can talk back to him and communicate. That was the divinely appointed reason the scriptures give for speech and language. Yes, there's another purpose to it too, okay? Now, first of all though, the scriptures reveal a, two pro, a twofold purpose for language and speech. One we saw already. It was designed as the vehicle whereby God, who is deity, infinite, and spirit, could communicate to man, who is a creature, finite, and flesh. It is the medium of communication between deity and humanity. And that's, the, that's the biggest point to remember. God created language. He created man with vocal cords to speak so that he could take his logo, which is thoughts, and put it into a vehicle that finite creatures could understand. Here's deity communicating. I hate to say, I don't want to say he's using words. Here's deity communicating. But deity can't communicate with humanity. They're on, they're on two different planes of existence. So what God does is he invents or creates this thing called language whereby deity words can come, switch around, and be understood into humanity. That was the purpose of it. So language is the vehicle that God used to bridge the gap between logos and human. Deity words and human words. And language was that thing. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ was incarnated, he was God in the flesh, right? Okay. He had a human body. He had all appearances of humanity. Was he human? Yes, he was. Was he God? Yes, he was. We got human words, right? Totally human words. Totally God words. See? They're in, the, they're in a robe. They're robed in flesh of humanity, human words. But what we got is God's words. They're in here clothed with humanity, just like the Lord Jesus Christ was clothed with the body of flesh, but he was God. Same thing you got right here. The Lord Jesus Christ was the express image of the Godhead. The words here are the express Im image of deity words. Okay, so these are just parallelisms. Now, the second reason why God gave language and speech was it was given benevolently by a benevolent God so that mankind could communicate with each other in their physical and sensory world. Yes, we admit that. But the evolutionist says that was the primary reason, so that man could sense out his sensory world. But that's not the primary reason the scriptures give. And I'm not talking to skeptics. We're, we're trying to teach Christians. So we see from the Bible that God gave language so that there'd be communication back and forth to him, right? Secondarily, he gave language so that man could share in the sensory things of his material world. And we also know that language is spiritual. And we also see like in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 14, it says, what man knows the things of man save the spirit of man which is in him. Okay? We could all understand each other because we've got a human spirit and we know the things that are common to man. But the things that are common to God, only the Holy Spirit could know. And now we're going to need something later on to show this. But what I'm trying to get across is, I don't care if you're German, French, Italian, Yugoslavian, and you were born and raised there, we've got one thing in common, right? We're human and we've got a human spirit and we can all understand the things of the human, right? So that eliminates a big problem right away. There isn't a thing that one human doesn't know that another human doesn't know. And I don't mean intelligence. I'm talking about the things of man. We all know what it's like to have to eat, sleep, go to the bathroom, do certain things. These are common to man. We know what pain means, right? We might not say it the same way, but don't we understand these things? Anguish, sorrow, the emotions. Don't we know these things? They're common to every race of people on the face of the earth, right? Okay. That eliminates a big barrier right away. See, that eliminates scads and scads of problems right off the bat. We'll, we'll develop that a little bit later on. Now, when words are spoken, and I'm doing that right now, they're only going to last for a few seconds in the air. I said. Okay, how long did that last? Two seconds? Where is it now? It's gone. It's in your mind, though, right? You heard me say I said, right? Now, you might keep it in your mind for a few years, maybe even a few decades, but eventually it's going to get sort of like lost, right? Now, they can, they can be retained for a considerably longer time when you put them in your mind, but if this could not suffice for permanence. You might forget, your mind slips after a while, you don't quite remember how it was said, and so writing was utilized. That's what we're coming to next. Verbalization or spoken words were given symbols called letters, 
which make up the equivalent of the spoken word, thus giving the spoken word permanence. And that's what God was looking for. I could speak, it's in the air for a couple seconds and it's gone, never to be recovered again. You might have heard what I said and you could keep it in your mind for a while, but 20 years from now I'll ask you, what did I say on November 4th at 8 o'clock in the morning? And you'll say, wait a minute, I think you said this. That wouldn't suffice for permanence. So God, again, boy, he's really smart. He figured out, I'll have him put it into these things called letters and write them so that they can last a long time and mean the same thing as what the guy spoke. Now that's pretty clever. Does Bobby, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, you know, I just got to say, like, I, I just go back and read some of your emotions from, they just read 20 years ago and I could recall what you said then. Right, you I could... I went by the word. Right, you could read the things that I wrote in some of my notes 20 years ago and understand them, which you couldn't if I just spoke them and you didn't write them down. Okay, good point. Now, what we have, uh, now the thing of it is now we have to understand that the scripture supports the idea that the spoken word has got equal status with the written word, or the written word has got equal status with the spoken word. Romans 4, 3, somebody wants to read that, and 1 Peter 1, 17 to 19. Okay. The Bible shows that the written word is given equal status with the spoken word. Equal status. Okay. Now remember, words, language, and then writing was developed to give permanence to words. So now instead of articulated sounds coming out, we've given them a tangible symbol called a letter or a word, which is writing, and that gives that word that was spoken permanence that could last an indefinite length of time, where spoken words can't last. Now this all sounds, you know, why are we getting to all this? Because we're laying a solid groundwork and a foundation, and this is what we want to do. This is, if we just get this done, done tonight, just a few more minutes, it's really important. Romans 4.3, Romans 4, you want to read that, and then 1 Peter 17.19. Okay, Abraham believed God, so we see that this, it says, what say it the scripture? So the, the scripture is the writing, so the, it's quoting what Abraham said, and it's equal status with what Abraham said. Sometimes written words have more validity than spoken words. Like sometimes it's not going to suffice for you to say something, they're going to say you write it and then have it author or have it uh, notarized. It's got more importance than the spoken word. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 17 to 19. So you want to read that one? <coughs> 17 to 19, yeah. And if you call it a founder, who is obviously the founder of the first, <coughs> thus to report every man's work at the time of his sojourn in your spirit, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the same manner of life received by tradition of the fathers, but that the precious blood of Christ as the lamb has brought us to the house of God. I don't, I think I got the wrong one, Walter. <laughs> but uh, to Peter, I'm sorry. No wonder it didn't sound right, Walter. I'm sorry. Okay. It, that sounded good. <laughs> to Peter, to Peter, one seventeen to nineteen. That's not going to be on the tape, huh? Okay, but the verses, we, we cited the verses so people could look them up. The point is, I'm just establishing with these two verses that according to the Bible, the written word is given equal status with the spoken word. Now, what we have so far is this, concerning language in the Bible. God Almighty spoke to his instrument, the prophet, in various ways. Then the prophet spoke verbally exactly what the Spirit of God inspired to be said. Then they put the communication, the, the, human, it was put into, the communication was put into human speech by the prophet. Now the prophet spoke and the scribe recorded what the spoken words were, giving them permanence by committing them to what we call writing. All three are exactly the equivalent of each other. That's why Deuteronomy 17, 18 to 20 says what it did. Now you have to understand this. God spoke. 
case, and I, I'm just going to diddle around with the board here. I'm not going to really draw nothing. But up here we got that God spoke. Down here, the prophet receives what God spoke in his mind somehow. We don't know how it happened. And then he in turn speaks out audibly into human language. After hearing deity words into his head, he speaks in human language. And then down here, the scribe puts it down and records it for permanence. It doesn't matter if you start here, them words that that scribe has got recorded is no different in any way than what the prophet spoke. And what the prophet spoke is no different from what God told him to speak. So I can go right to here and say that's equivalent to that. There's no difference. I, this is a, you gotta really understand it. It's very important. It's a really important point. It don't matter whether the prophet's speaking it, whether it's written down, or whether God's saying it, all three are exactly the same. They're all God's words. The only difference is, you've got the word up here, logos, deity, and it's now translated into human language, but it's saying exactly what deity wanted said. So, for all intents and purposes, what you've got here is deity. You've got deity words in human language. That's the translation. It's recorded in writing. It's recorded in writing, right. So, whether it's written, spoken, or God said it through the Spirit makes no difference. All three are exactly equivalent. Now, I'll go a step further. We're going to prove this a little later on. What if I take that and recopy it onto another sheet of paper? Is that any different than that? No. Is that any different than that? Is that any different than that? So now we can all the way go, didn't Moses say that in Deuteronomy 17, 17, make you a copy that you can do all this law? So then Moses is saying, if you can do all the law or hear all the words of this law, then obviously Moses is giving credibility to the copy of the original being equal with the original, which is equal with what he said, which is equal with what God said. So now we've already established that a copy can be God's word. We don't need an original. Okay? But the big problem they say, that's easy. But how about from a copy from one language into another? That's where they have all their problems. That's what textual criticism is involved with. You see the harebrained stuff they're coming up with? They bog down in that one area. Oh, that was easy. That was easy. That was easy. And even this ain't so bad. But this? I, you know, like I say, my big problem is I don't understand how it got from here to here. That's the real problem. And God took care of that one. After that, it's nothing. You see? But they're bogged down between here and here. And some, some of them are bogged down between here and here even. Doesn't make any difference. But we're going to go on and we gotta, I got to end up. Uh, how much time have I got, Jim? Jim, no, really, because I, I don't want to go. Okay, okay. I don't want to be too late, guys. I'm going to end up in about 10 minutes. Just give me 10 minutes. I believe Adam and Eve knew how to write. That's my personal opinion. I'm not going to prove that. I can't prove that. I just believe they did. Uh, but we're going to see this in a little minute now. Okay, now we got that far. Now, here's the thing of it. They say that uh, <coughs> the statement that, oh yeah, a copy of God's original word is fine, but a copy into another language, that becomes a problem. Now, to answer that contention, we're going we're to do this. We're going to show this real quickly. And I'm going to stop here, I promise. I, I don't want to go too far. Genesis 11, if you want to turn there. If, if you're not understanding this, or if for some reason it's not clear, ask me and I'll just go over this again. Because it, it's really important to get a solid foundation underneath you first. So what we've done so far, we've, we've did pretty good tonight. I feel that we've eliminated all the way from here. I mean, if, assuming that you're a Christian who believes in the verbal, you believe in inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration, right? I don't want to have to prove inspiration. That's another field of itself. If we believe that God spoke and the prophet recorded, uh, spoke and, and the scribe recorded, we've eliminated already from, from the verbal word of God, we're already in the copies now, and we don't have any problem, right? Yeah, this, cop, this scribe could make a mistake from that copy to that copy, he could. This guy could make a mistake what the prophet said. How do we know he didn't? The prophet could have made a mistake, you see? These are things we just have to accept. We have to assume. We can't, we can't start playing games in here. Because we're, and we're not just taking it by faith. We're taking it because God said it. See, we've got to remember that. He said he's going to preserve it. We don't, we don't have to play around and say, well, maybe something happened in between here. We're going to get into it a little later. But we've already eliminated all the problems of textual stuff all the way from here all the way into a copy in the same language. 
Now, all we have to do from here is go into a copy from one language into another, and we're going to work on that in the coming sessions. Now, at one time, the whole world spoke one language, one dialect, Genesis 11, 1. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Now, if they had writing at that time, which I think they did, then they also had one written language. But that's not important to us. It really doesn't matter whether it's so or not. We do know they had one language. Now, because of sin and rebellion, we find out that mankind, in their attempt to unify in rebellion against God, built a tower. And because of the building of this tower, God came down and diversified their languages into multiple languages so that they couldn't understand one another anymore. And they had to leave off building the tower. It'd be like me saying, Steve, pass me a brick. And then all of a sudden, my mouth goes, blah, 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 and Steve goes, blah, 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 and, and what the heck? You know, nobody knows what's going on here. How can we build? Is it two inches, Steve? What's inches? You know, they had to stop building. They just could not do it. So that's why God did that and diversified your languages. Now, we think that God's only purpose for doing that was so these guys couldn't build a tower. And so for the rest of human history, men were divided into these different languages, all because somebody back there wanted to build a tower and we're stuck with it today. Is God that shallow? You see, he had a purpose. He did it at that time, but he knew what he was doing. He didn't do it just for them guys. That was part of it, yeah. But that ain't the only reason why God did it. Did you know that the world then became divided by nations according to tongues and languages? Now, there was the purpose that God had, okay? Now, the scriptures state that the purpose for God confusing their language was so that they couldn't communicate with one another, not so that God could not communicate with them. And that is a very important point. Again, I keep saying important points, but it's important. When God diversified or multiplied their languages, he did not do it so that they couldn't understand him and he couldn't understand them. He did it so they couldn't understand each other. So, did the original language that man spoke, the one language, come from God? Yes. Did they have to learn the other language that God divided them into? No. Okay, did God give them that language as well? Yes. Did all the languages come from God? Right. Did God change purpose number one for giving languages? No. Did he change purpose number two for giving languages? You might say yes, but he only modified it, right? I mean, if he made it so that man couldn't communicate with man at all, then we could say no, purpose number two, uh, he changed it. He didn't change purpose number two, he just modified it. He made it so now that man could not understand every other man, but they could understand within their own language group, right? So even purpose number two wasn't changed, it was just modified. Them are important concepts. Now, Acts 2, 1 to 11, and we're going to end really with this in just a minute, okay? Acts 2, verses 1 to 11. It's almost so, uh, so familiar, we really don't even have to read it. But for the sake of the tape, we will. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, in Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Greeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, we count 14 different nations represented here, and they all heard... God speaking in their tongue. The prophet, or the, the apostle, speaking the words of God, the wonderful works of God, all in their own language. So what I want to emphasize here is, you can say, well, wait a minute. The apostles were under the power of the Holy Spirit. They were under inspiration. They were under both, granted. But was it not possibly, possible, semantically, grammatically, and linguistically to translate that into 14 different languages and all mean the same thing? Wasn't it being done here? Fourteen people heard God's word in their own language, right? So we could at least say fourteen different languages. It was possible 
to have God's Word translated into 14 languages semantically, linguistically, and grammatically and be correct. Whether they're under inspiration or not is incidental. It doesn't make any difference. It was possible to do it, and it was done. Does that tell me that God's Word can be translated into other languages? Yeah. Absolutely. And still be God's Word? Okay. Now, last one on this, and we're going to end. Luke 23, 38. And we're going to close out with this verse. Luke chapter 23, verse 38. Twenty-three thirty-eight. This was when they put a superscription or a, a writing over the cross of Christ, and there's some reasons why the other Gospels give a little different interpretation, but that's, a tr that's not a translation problem, that's an interpretation problem. But let's just deal with this. And a superscription also was written over him in letters, in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Get these words. This is the king of the Jews. It was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew and we have it recorded in English. All three of those languages were ex said exactly the same thing. This is the king of the Jews. It was said in Latin, it was said in Greek, and it was said in Hebrew. And they all said the same thing. And it's also God's word. So God's word was there translated into three different languages, and they all meant exactly the same thing, right? And we have it in the fourth, English. So what I'm trying to tell you, if it was possible to take God's word and put it into three languages, then it's possible to take God's word and put it into 3,000 languages and take 3,000 verses and put it into 3,000 languages. That's all I'm trying to prove at this point right now. But we're going to even steal this further, okay? So we'll just close out now and we'll, we'll put the tape off and then we'll just ask some general questions about this, okay?